What's up and welcome to the Grant Burton Film and TV Show, the show dedicated to giving you all the top news, views, reviews, previews, features, opinions and more. I'm your host Grant Burton, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore Grant Burton or you can go to thoughtsbygrant.wordpress.com for all of my written reviews. On today's show I'm reviewing Luke Cage Season 2, Goliath Season 2, I'm going to talk a little about the shape of water and more, but we start each and every week with the news. Item number one. According to Jim Starlin, the creator of Thanos, Marvel will be releasing an extended version of Avengers Infinity War with 30 minutes more footage focusing on Thanos' backstory. I really liked Avengers Infinity War. It's probably one of my favourite films this year. One of the best superhero films, I would say, of all time as well. But I don't think it needs 30 more minutes of footage, and if it does need more footage, Thanos is not the character you want to focus on. If anything, Captain America and Black Widow are the characters you want to add more footage of, because they did get a little short changed in the film. And I'm a little worried that if this is true, because it is just rumours right now, if this is true, what will it do to the pacing of the film? Will it slow things down, or will it drastically change my interpretation of the film? I don't know. But... It's not officially announced, and Marvel hasn't done extended cuts before on any of its MCU films, so take this with a grain of salt, it might not actually happen. Next news story is... Right. The, this is a tough topic to talk about. I don't want to offend anyone, I don't want to upset anyone, but so I'm going to be careful with the things I say. Scarlett Johansson has been cast as a trans man in the upcoming movie, in an upcoming movie. Addressing the backlash, she told her representatives, tell them they can be directed to Jeffrey Tambor, Jared Leto, and Felicity Huffman's reps for comment. So, let me get this out of the way straight away. In an ideal world, we'd be able to cast a trans actor or actress in a leading role in a Hollywood movie. In an ideal world. But we don't live in an ideal world, sadly. In order to get a Hollywood movie made, many times you have to cast a big name actor or actress in order to sell tickets and to help the marketing and promotion of the film. That's exactly what's going on here. Scarlett Johansson has been cast in this film because she's a well-known name. People will go to see this film because she's in it. That being said, there are trans actors and actresses out there they could very well have just cast one of them and it would have not gotten as much backlash in fact probably would have got like a round of applause because that's a really great move and a really good way to move the industry forward scully hansen's comment though she does have a point in that these actors and actresses that she's pointed out are all award-winning actors and actresses who play trans characters and yet none of them are actually trans in real life so she does have a little bit of a point there, but it's a little snarky, a little negative the way she's done it. She could have worded it better if she actually sent this to her representatives. And whoever her representatives are, oh, they should not have released this comment. They should have said, nope, this is not a good comment, do not release this. But they did, and the problem is that instead of acknowledging that there's a trend here in Hollywood that non-trans actors and actresses get cast in these roles. What she should have done is said, no, I'm not going to do this role because there are trans actors and actresses out there who deserve this role and who could do it better than me and who are more suitable to it. So instead of following that trend, she should have just made a statement and moved aside, which is something that actually happened in a recent film, Hellboy, the reboot of Hellboy, which is coming out next year, I believe. There was an Asian, an Asian character, but they cast a white American. I believe he's American. I could be wrong. Actually, I don't think he is American now that I said that. I think he's like Scandinavian or something. But they cast him as an Asian character. But he said, nope, I'm stepping down from this. There are many Asian actors out there who could take on this role instead. So, yeah, this is not a good look for Scarlett. Her representatives have made a bad choice of actually publishing this comment, I think. And, yeah, they've made a mistake here. So, moving on. Story number two. Vanessa Kirby, this is from Jeremy Fuster at The Wrap. Vanessa Kirby has joined the cast 
of Jason Statham and The Rock as the sister of Jason Statham's character in the Fast and Furious spin-off, currently called Hobbs and Shaw. So, Vanessa Kirby, great actress. Probably best known for her work in The Crown, to Main Street all instance, but she is a very well-known and renowned theatre actress. That's where the majority of her work is. She's really on the rise right now. She's going to be something big. She's currently going to be in Mission Impossible Fallout. I think she's got a supporting role in that. So being one of the main characters in this film, huge up for her. A lot of good things coming her way. And just a little add on to this. Idris Elba is also in talks to join this film as the film's villain. So the Fast and Furious franchise is a huge blockbuster affair now. They get big names and big action scenes and so on. And it's looking like the spin-off is going to be just like that. Cassidy this Elba is a big bold move showing that they're going to treat this with the same manner as the main franchise. Jeff Snyder from Collider says that Child's Play Reboot is in the work from the producers of IT. Lars Klevberg, director of upcoming horror film Polaroid will direct and it's written by Tyler Burton Smith, the writer of Kung Fury and the video game Quantum Break. It's going to be about a group of kids in modern day with a technologically advanced doll. So, a little backstory about Child's Play. Universal currently owns the home video rights, but MGM owns the rights to everything else. They actually own the franchise. So, you've got this reboot being planned with completely new producers, crew and cast. Brad Dorf is not returning to voice Chucky in this film, which is probably going to take a lot of getting used to for big fans of the series. I've never actually seen any of these films, so I don't really care to be honest. But there is a Child's Play TV series in the work from the actual makers of the previous films and with Brad Dorif voicing the role of Chucky again. So this doesn't necessarily mean the end of the franchise you may know and love. And the producers of It, that's a good take. They're clearly getting in on that with the kids and it could be some Stranger Things vibes going on here as well. And as for the new director, I don't know him. His new film Polaroid, I know nothing about. But horror films tend to be a good entryway for new upcoming directors. So he could be something worth looking out for. I don't know. This is from The Economist. Netflix will be spending more on content than any Hollywood studio or television company, excluding sports programming, and it will be releasing far more content than any of its rivals in 2018. It's going to release 82 films in total in 2018, and the closest runner-up is Warner Brothers, which is only releasing 23. Netflix has yet to make a profit and has an $8.5 billion debt. Despite the debt, the company is flourishing though, because it's constantly getting new subscribers and new viewers in there. I think, believe it's making like $14 billion a year based on its subscriptions. And they are introducing new subscription tiers in Europe as a test. So things might be working well for them. But Netflix, what's interesting is it's now basically a must-have. You go to anyone's house, they've either heard of Netflix or they've got Netflix. It's sitting there right alongside their cable or network provider here in the UK. It's Sky, Virgin, or BT. They, Netflix is right alongside them as a must-have thing for any TV viewer. The only thing that's really lacking in is uh, sports viewing. It doesn't have, at least here in the UK, it doesn't have like live sports or anything like that, which I'm sure it will get eventually. So, but the problem is with, what is it, 80, 82 films, that's just the films, not including any TV shows or documentaries or anything like that. Could this be a case of quantity over quality? Because a lot of Netflix shows, they do great on the first season, but then the second season comes out and they're not quite as good. There are some exceptions, but in general, that's kind of happened, especially if you look at the Marvel shows. So the amount of stuff that they're releasing as well, this is a lot of content. Will subscribers be able to keep up with it all? Will it become overwhelming? For me, there's just tons out there that I can't even think of getting into because I just don't have the time. And yet I'm well aware that there's shows there that are meant to be really good. 
I do try to watch the major Netflix shows though. Next up. Announced at Anime Expo, Legendary Pictures will co-produce a live-action Gundam film alongside Sunrise, the owners of the series. So, I'm actually really surprised they've never made a Gundam film before. This series is ripe for feature film making. And I think one of the reasons they probably haven't is because of the Transformers films. There are similarities, they're all about big mechs and robots. Now, in Gundam, they are like, it's a bit like Pacific Rim, there are actually people inside the the mechs, whereas in Transformers, the robots are creatures themselves. So, but Gundam has a lot of cool lore and science fiction concepts in the franchise, and it's really ripe for the Pickens to make a film out of. My concern is that it might just end up being like Transformers in that it's CGI heavy, action heavy, lots of explosions, more style over substance, when I know the seas could be much better. I watched Mobile Suit Gundam Wing when I was a kid. I liked that show. I haven't watched it since, I'll be honest, but I always think this series could make a good film. Final story of the day. Daniel Cohn at The Wrap. Sony accidentally posted the full Kali the Killer movie on YouTube instead of the trailer. It was up for 8 hours before being removed and it received 11,000 views. <laughs> so, well... Accidents happen, don't they? I've been uploading videos on YouTube recently, and longer videos take longer to upload, so there's a big difference between uploading a film that's like an hour and a half to two hours long than there is to uploading a 46 second trailer or whatever it is. So someone must have thought, hmm, this is taking a long time to upload, why is this happening? I, yeah. I imagine this was just something that was passed along to some lackey somewhere, say, yeah, you upload it, and they just left it there, they probably didn't know what exactly they were doing. But, yeah, a lot of people have actually now seen this film and downloaded it. I don't actually know what this film is, I don't plan on seeing it. So, yeah, a little funny story. We're moving on to the trailers now, and there are two trailers this week, one of which I've literally just watched. So, let's get straight into it. Better Call Saul Season 4. Not a lot to actually say about this trailer. It looks like it's more Better Call Saul. I actually think Better Call Saul might be a little better than Breaking Bad. I know that's going to be a divisive thought, but as a prequel series, Better Call Saul is one of the best ever made because it's not just playing fan service to what we know is going to come. Every time it introduces a character or some sort of reference from Breaking Bad, it actually makes sense and it actually adds to the show as a whole. It's not just there to say, oh, look, we saw that person before. No, there's actually a really good, interesting way that they do it. So, more Better Call Saul, I'm all for it. I Am The Knight. This is a limited series on TNT, I think it is. I could be wrong about that, though. And it looks interesting, conspiracy theory, thriller, mixed in with noir. Very interesting, but that's not what I want to talk about. Instead, I want to talk about Chris Pine's hair. Yeah, because ever since Star Trek, which basically catapulted Chris Pine into stardom, he's had the exact same haircut. Now, yeah, he might get a little bit of a comb over to make it look a little different, to style it a little different, but he never changes his hairstyle. This is a period piece, and I've seen him in period pieces before, and he has the same hairstyle. A hairstyle that's really modern, arguably trendy, and it just looks so out of place at times. So, I could be wrong, I might be getting really nitpicky, but I think he's probably got something in his contract where they're not allowed to change his hairstyle. Just saying, it's noticeable. Moving on to the reviews this week, and I've got three reviews that I want to get to, so let's get straight to it. Luke Cage Season 2. Overall, I think Luke Cage Season 2 is a little bit better than the first season, and the first season's not bad. It's got the exact same problems that the first season had, the exact same problems that every Marvel Netflix show has had so far. It's too long, episodes are way too long at times. 
there are a couple episodes in this season that are struggling to get under an hour long and they really don't need to be that long. So this results in pacing issues. The first three or four episodes and the final three or four episodes are good. Everything in between is just boring, generic, gangster, crime story stuff. And one of the things I liked about this season in particular was they introduced a new villain called Bushmaster. Despite the stupid name, I actually really quite like this character. And with some of Marvel's recent stuff, they've done something similar in that maybe he's not entirely the bad guy. I'm not going to get into spoilers because that will ruin it. But yeah, a good villain. I want to talk about Alfred Woodard though, because she's kind of the main villain this season. She was one of the main villains in the first season. I can't fault her as an actress. I've seen her in other things. She's a good actress. Even in this, what she's doing is fine. But... God damn it, she's annoying. Every time she's on screen, she's just so annoying and frustrating. The way she pronounces words, the way she's performing, I think the directing behind her is just bad. Everything's like over exaggerated and emphasized. And it just, she often feels like really out of place compared to everything else going on there. But like I said, the actual performance, if you separate it from everything else going on, the performance is fine. It's just annoying. The next show I want to talk about is Goliath Season 2. I really liked the first season of Goliath, but the problem was with the first season, the villains often came across as a, a knockoff, poorly done Bond villain. And this season is better than the first season, quite a bit better. It's darker, more serious, the pacing's a bit better as well I would say. The problem is that with the darker tone in this season, there's a lot less comedy. One of the things I really liked about the first season is that there was a lot of comedy, a lot of jokes, a lot of sarcasm in there, and it really made the show just a bit more enjoyable, and it added a little character to it. Because the first season did have its darker points as well, but I feel like it's lost a bit of its charm and character this time around. The cast again is great. A lot of the characters from the first season return. Billy Bob Thornton is brilliant. Like, he's brilliant in everything. You can't do wrong with Billy Bob Thornton. There are tons of twists and turns. The show is really well made. It's visually stunning. But there's one episode in particular, right towards the end, which I think is absolutely brilliant. I'm not going to go into too much spoilers, but I'll say this. Billy Bob Thornton wakes up in a house. He has no idea how he's got there. He's got no idea who any of the people in this house are. And for some reason, they're not letting him leave. The majority of this episode is just him trying to figure out what the hell's going on. It's really well done. And I love that episode. The problem with this season is the ending. As a episode, the ending's not bad. But it is disappointing. Because there are things that feel really rushed. Because there are only eight episodes here. There are things that just rush by. You have characters coming out saying, oh, this and this happened, and yeah, that guy's gone, or whatever, rather than us actually seeing it happen. So it's annoying, because they built up all this, and then they've just wrapped things up with a simple sentence, and it feels very unfulfilling at times. But like I said, the episode itself's not bad. They're just, it feels like they had to change some stuff. And I know that this season had some production issues and like halfway through they had to go back and redo some stuff and I think a lot of the stuff in the end might have actually been from the reshoots. The next thing I want to talk about is Game Night. You can get my full thoughts on this on forcebygrant.wordpress.com if you're really interested. Game Night is one of the best comedies I've seen in a very long time. It's really funny. It's dark and twisted at times, there are plenty of surprises and twists and turns, but don't let that fool you because this is a pretty by-the-book comedy. You know exactly what's going to happen, you know, you know when it's going to happen, and the surprises do throw a wrench in the works, but you can quickly work out why they've done that. The cast is great, I love Jason Bateman. And Rachel McAdams is really good in this film. You don't see her do many comedies anymore, but she can do comedy really well. It's very well directed and it's, the cinematography is great. 
which and this is one of the most surprising things about it because you think of a comedy film in the modern day you think all right it's a by the books comedy you know exactly the sort of things you're going to see but no this is actually many times this film looks and feels more like an action film or a thriller than it does a comedy and there's a real attention being put into the actual artistic side of it which i'm not saying comedies don't do this but this seems to have just a little bit more than what most comedies do and that's it for this week i hope you've liked it if you haven't i'm sorry leave me some advice some criticism in the comments below i'll try to address that in the next episode if you like what you've seen though i'd appreciate it if you subscribed give me a thumbs up share this across social media because any little helps i want to build my audience and i'd really really appreciate it I'm Grant Burton, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore Grant Burton, or you can go to forcebygrant.wordpress.com for all of my written reviews. Until next time though, I'm Grant Burton, hope you like the show, if not, well, I'm out. <laughs>